Okay, so our final speaker of the school year is uh, Chris Kar Karani, who is a partner at McAndrews uh, just down the street. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that uh, Mr. Karani is one of the leading experts in design law uh, practicing today. Uh, Chris Karani was practicing design before design really became design, like design patents and design protection was uh, as popular as, as it is today. Uh, and he's a highly sought after speaker. Uh, he's speaking at Stanford, was the next week, uh, et cetera. So we're really quite pleased that he's able to fit us in in this busy schedule. Uh, he also is a research affiliate of our center, so we're really happy that he's involved uh, with our center. Just a quick bio on uh, Chris. He graduated from the University of Chicago uh, Law School. He clerked for Judge Palmeyer here in the Northern District of Illinois. Uh, he's practiced at McAndrews since 1995. Uh, and uh, he also teaches as an adjunct uh, teaching design law at Northwestern uh, and as well as Chicago Kent. And maybe some of you took the design uh, course uh, this January uh, that was offered uh, by um, Chris. Uh, he's here today to talk about his book uh, that he's the lead editor on, Design Rights, Functionality, and Scope of Protection. Uh, it talks about functionality uh, in a number of different countries and the approach to functionality uh, the laws of those countries uh, takes with respect to design protection. So with that, I'll turn it to uh, Chris, and uh, he'll speak for 30 or so minutes, and we'll have time for Q&A. Thanks, Great. Is this, is this good right there? Right here. Right here. Right here. All right, thank you everyone for being here. It's good to be back. I just uh, wrapped up the uh, teaching for the class here, the design law class. Um, I think there's a couple people in here who, who took the class. Um, but we were, some of the content that we're going to go over today was, was discussed during the class, but we're going to get a little deeper into so, some of the more. Um, uh, I suppose, nitty-gritty on a couple of the, the key issues here, one being this scope of protection issue and one being functionality. I also understand that some people here might not have a deep background in design law to begin with, um, perhaps more uh, experience with respect to utility patent law or perhaps trademarks and copyrights. Design patents, as we call them in the U.S., sort of falls within that middle space. So we'll uh, lay some foundation so before we can get to sort of the, the two key issues were part of this book. Before beginning, I um, wanted to uh, acknowledge one of the co-authors who's an alumnus of, of uh, Kent, Chicago Kent, who's in the back, uh, Dunstan Barnes is in the back, and he was uh, in instrumental in helping bring this book uh, to fruition. So another proud Chicago Kent uh, graduate. Design rights. Um, I think that probably the most interesting part when you're dealing with design rights, a part that really has pulled me towards teaching design rights and working in it in, in, a, in a field of practice is the fact that you get to use visuals. And uh, rather than, for instance, dry claim language that you might be able to, in a, in a utility patent context, it's hard sometimes to communicate in a short amount of time like we have today. So visuals often are the best way to, to get down to what, what, what is the issues that were before us today. This, I, I don't know if I coined this term. I was just preparing the slides and I, I sort of combined a, I've heard of a spork, but I've never heard of a spork knife or spork knife, I guess. I, I, maybe it's already out there. I didn't check. But in any event, the, the notion here is the, there would be two main questions that the book looks at. One, is something like this eligible subject matter for a design right? Um, and then secondly, are there any aspects of the design which should be disregarded or uh, eliminated when it comes time to what is the protection, the scope of protection that we offer for a product. For instance, is the, the knife portion, the bowl on the spoon, or the tines on the fork, are those particular elements, should those be included in the scope of protection when comparing that to an accused, to an accused uh, product? So sort of the first issue is one of sort of statutory compliance, one of eligibility. That's the first issue. The second issue is, okay, you have your design right. Are there any portions thereof that should be excluded? And we'll go through um, those two particular questions. 
the, the book here is on the right, is, uh, which was published late last year by Walters Kluwer's Design Rights, Functionality, and Scope of Protection. Um, but there's a predecessor article that I had written back in the, uh, 2014 in the ABA's landslide, which really was the precursor to the book, although yet this is an issue that I've been um, uh, studying for uh, close to 18 years, um, deeply uh, following this particular issue. So it all sort of culminated, firstly, in, in this particular article was much more of a U.S. approach, a U.S.-based approach. Um, and then the secondly is saying, okay, let's open this up. Uh, we opened it up to 27 jurisdictions worldwide, studying how this issue was, um, was uh, approached. The uh, initial um, beginnings of the book was at the 2017 AIPPI World Congress on Designs in Milan. And at that, the AIPPI, which is an international uh, IP association, convened and prepared a resolution, and I had the, the, the honor, honor and privilege to chair that particular question, but the issue was functionality and coming up with a resolution, a, a resolution that was uh, with the uh, almost 100 countries that were before and trying to find out not what is the, well, first you had to study what is the, what is the law in your particular jurisdiction, but then in a much more aspirational sense, what should the law be? And I think that is one of the things in design law is that, you know, yes, we all look back at precedent and it's helpful, but because there's a paucity, there is, a, there is, there is not a, a wealth of jurisprudence in this particular area that there very much is a, an opportunity to say, okay, Let's think about this again. I mean, what should the law be? Do we, it's rather than just resting on, on the past. As we get into this, I, I know there's people coming perhaps from some foreign jurisdictions or jurisdictions where it's the, the terminology for design rights is going to be different. And this is the least harmonized area, whether it's copyright, trademarks, patents. Designs are the least harmonized, both respect to law, but also semantics. And, and I think uh, once we look at these things, we call them design patents here in the United States. The rest of the world, you'll hear them referred to as design registrations, for instance, in Europe. You'll hear them as industrial uh, designs in Canada, design models in other wealth parts of the world. There's only about three or four countries in the world that even refer to these as design patents. Pat design patents fall underneath the Patent Act in the United States, 35 USC. We call them design patents, so that hopefully that uh, we can overcome that semantical difference. There's a design patent claim is uh, technically a requirement in the U.S. Elsewhere in the world, they might just call it a design. But using the claiming technology, the terminology is a, is a, is a convenient way to, dis to discuss what is the portion of a design. I've got a, a coffee cup with a handle, but I'm only claiming the handle. That's the only portion my design right is directed at, using this for claim. Overall appearance, in Europe you might hear overall impression. In the United States, we say the ordinary observer. In Europe, that in the rest of the world, I might consider that the informed user. And this idea of claim construction, as we talk about in the United States, much of the rest of the world, they'll refer to it as the scope of protection. So just a little bit of vocabulary and, and, a, and a rough guide at the outset here. We also want to make sure that we sort of, before we launch into this discussion, that we organize our, our mental sort of file folders regarding what type of right we're talking about. When we're talking about appearance in the United States, you're going to be detaching on design patents, trade dress, copyright, and it's very easy to get confused between all of those different doctrines. Each one has their own unique policies, they have their own unique terms, they have their own, own unique requirements for protection for the type of uh, remedies that you're provided. So we are going to be focusing up here in the design patent realm, not on trade dress, not on copyright. Look, I'm not going to go through any, each one of these. You've, you sort of may see tables like these in textbooks talking about the different comparative aspects to them. But I do bring this up because I think one of the things through the book, it, it, it becomes a, uh, it's essential that you do not grossly appropriate doctrine from other IP rights and import them in um, without due care and due thought. For instance, you cannot go into trade dress doctrine and grossly appropriate the functionality doctrine that's used there in trade dress law and then plop it into design patent law. There are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't do that. Um, the rights are different. The policy considerations between the two different rights are, are, are quite different. The, uh, the, where, its, where its rootings are in the U.S. Constitution 
being that it's not a patent right, for instance, trade dress rights or in the Commerce Clause. So you really have to be careful. This is a fine balance between each one of these rights. So uh, uh, grossly, and it's, it's, we're not going to go into that today, but it's, it's outlined in the book as to why you would not want to engage in this gross uh, borrowing from other types of IP rights. So one way to think about this functionality doctrine is sort of on a spectrum. Um, and probably the, the, the one that's used quite commonly is what, what's, what is the big issue here with functionality on a design patent? If you were to give a, a design patent, if someone were to get a design patent on a, on a ball bearing, okay, they would be using a design right as a backdoor way to uh, appropriate the utilita utilitarian feature of a ball bearing. Because there's no other way. Because if you weren't able to get a design right on that particular shape, the theory goes there's no other particular form that could achieve that which a ball bearing achieves. So we don't want to provide protection for design rights for these particular efforts. There are on the other side of the spectrum things that are purely artistic, that are not a, have anything to do with an article of manufacture. But really where the, where, the, where the challenges occur for whether or not to provide a right in a design context occur with everything in the middle. And when you get close to this particular line here on the right side, that when you get close to this sort of purely functional, purely dictated by function, that's where, where there's a lot of interest. That's where you've got a lot of interesting cases, um, whether it is things that are um, uh, tools, um, we just recently had the case in Europe, the centering pins case and the Dossaran case. Um, the closer you get to that line, that's where uh, a lot of the doctrine um, has some difficulties. So on design patents, just as a quick primer for those who are not that well-versed in designs, you only have one claim for design patent. The term is 15 years from issuance, not from an earliest effective filing date, 15 years from issuance. It used to be 14 years a few years back. Now it's to bring us into... Um, harmonization for international treaty, we're at 15 years. There's no maintenance fees for design patents. The typical pendency is 9 to 12 months, and there is continuation practice available, and I would put parenthetically essential for those, to, if you really want to have a strategic and enforceable design portfolio. Design rights, they can protect the shape, the configuration, the surface ornamentation, the color, the combination of those things. Those are all things that you want to consider getting protection. As far as the statutory requirements, we have Section 102 with novelty, Section 103 with non-obviousness, and then you have this orna ornamental. And that's the phrase that's actually used in the statute. If you speak to designers, uh, Industrial Designer Society of America, I uh, speak there quite often and am a, a member of the group. Um, this phrase, ornamental, is something that uh, they're not too fond of. This is not a term that you would hear most designers saying that I want to design something ornamental. Um, they're typically trying to meld form and function, and uh, they, they, they look at it, um, or it's like fingers on a chalkboard when you just slap on some ornament for the purpose of ornament. Uh, but that's the term that's in the, in the statute itself. In Section 171, it has to be ornamental. When you're reviewing designs, also understand that, uh, generally speaking, solid lines are part of the claim, dotted lines are not part of the claim. So when you're looking at a design patent claim, like I said, the coffee, coffee mug, if the handle is only in solid lines and the rest of the mug is in dotted lines, when you're going to be doing your infringement analysis, you're only going to be looking at that portion which is in solid lines. That's how we define the claim in a, in a design patent. Just like in a utility patent, you might have your entire specification, but then you come to the end and you see your claims, that is stating forth the sort of meets and bounds of your right. So by way of example, you've got this Microsoft webcam here. You can see the upper housing is in solid lines, the lower housing is in dotted lines. Thus, when it comes time to infringement, you're only comparing the upper housing of the patent to the upper housing of the accused instrumentality. So whatever is on the bottom, if the accused product has an S clamp, a J clamp, an L clamp, it, it won't matter. You're only going to be comparing that which is shown in solid lines. Just another quick example on this chair. The bottom of the legs in an accused product wouldn't matter. Now, that also goes in reverse. And you hear a lot talking about, well, in this context of infringement. But this also plays with respect to validity. Now, where you're going to compare to the prior art, if you find a device that has the same upper but has um, uh, very different legs, for instance, maybe has a single leg on the bottom, 
you can't point that out as a difference. You've disclaimed that. Your claim is only directed towards the upper portion. So it's important as far as claim construction, and we know as bedrock, your claim construction used for infringement should be the same claim construction that's used for validity. One quick question. Please. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you write that same patent without the bottom, the, the, without the dotted lines there? Would that matter? Sure, you could. And, and so, so the question is, could, could you just eliminate this and not include it at all? Uh, you could, and I think your scope of protection would be pretty similar. Um, but there are other reasons might, why you might want to include those. One, for context, to show where this generally is. It might give you a little more information about it. But also, in the United States in particular, where we have continuation practice, in other words, you could later in, in, in prosecution convert these to solid lines, and perhaps this came from something that was solid lines and converted it to dotted lines. So there's some reasons why we might do that. I think also it comes into play, and this hasn't played out completely, but we're waiting to hear more from uh, regarding the Apple v. Samsung saga um, with respect to what is the article of manufacture. And so where you perhaps you've only shown the upper portion, I think there fairly you're probably locking yourself into just the upper portion. But here where you've shown the rest of the device, I think there's a better argument can be made that the relevant art article of manufacture to which the design has been applied is a chair. And that's relevant for damages. That, that, that could be relevant for damages, and I would say also which gets much less talked about for injunctive relief. And uh, that, that's something that, <laughs> that, that's another, maybe another book at some time. <laughs> okay, so why is this important? Let's say design patent on the left, accused product on the right. Is there infringement between the two? Um, one might be thinking, well, I see this exact paddle on the inside of there. I mean, to the T, it's verbatim. But because the test is the overall appearance to that which is claimed, which is the overall bottle, to the accused product, there'll be no infringement in the situation. The overall appearance of a bottle compared to the overall appearance of the paddle is not the same. So this is why it's, this is unlike the, cop in, in, for instance, in copyright, let's say, for instance, where you have a 20-chapter book, and somebody copies, copies chapter 17 from your book. You're still going to have infringement in that context. But in the design context, because we have, before the fact, a claim where you're setting forth what your claim is, um, that is effectively the meets and bounds of your claim. It's set in stone. So in this particular situation, what you would want to do, or one particular approach you might consider doing, is a more uh, sort of elemental approach claiming particular components of the design in order to provide that type of protection. For instance, if there's, a, if there's a market for replacement nipples that you want to defend, you might want to get protection just on that particular, on that particular uh, element itself. So it's, and, and this is all foundational for the arguments on functionality because it's important to know that there are no independent rights in portions of a design. It's always the amalgam, and this is the, the, the amalgam, the ensemble. And think about it, it's no different than in a utility patent context. If you have elements, claim one, A, B, C, D, E, and E is a wheel, you don't have any rights in a wheel. You only have rights in the combination with A plus B plus C plus T and E. So it's always the combination. You don't have independent, uh, independent rights. And this comes into play because there seems to be this, um, this fear or this boogeyman of in a design claim, if you had, for instance, a car, a design claim on a car and you had a wheel, oh, we, we need to eliminate the wheel because that's a functional feature. And we don't want to provide rights for a wheel. Well, no one's providing rights for a wheel. And, and as we'll get into it, this is precisely, if you see, it's actually codified in the European Design Directive where they say that you cannot provide, there, there can be no protection for features of a design. And this is where you get into European courts looking at individual features of a design and eliminating those as if it's, um, uh, you know, plucking things off the shelf that they can be sort of surgically excised from a design. We'll get much more that the design has to be looked at as the composite of all those things which are claimed and in, in, in set forth in the claim. It's also in, uh, instructive to look at what the test is for infringement. The test for infringement is we look in the eye of an ordinary observer. The two designs have to be substantially the same. Now, this is from Gorham v. White, the same test, which was, uh, it was a, the seminal case for design patent infringement, Supreme Court, 1871, the first and only time that they've spoken on design patent infringement. Uh, it was the same exact test that was provided to the jury 
in San Jose in 2011 and 2012 in Apple v. Samsung. Um, and you pretty much see this same paragraph in every design patent infringement case uh, that, that you read. The language is a little bit garbled. It's a little bit sort of hard to read. I think there's a, a, a need for a restatement, I suppose, to make it a little easier. And you'll see that in a moment. Images always tell the story. So let's look at that. You got Gorham's patented design on the left, and you got a White's accused design on the right. This was about flatware. And it was only on the handle, incidentally. I mean, this, we talk so much about partial designs. This is, to me, the, you know, the original partial, partial design. I mean, this is well, not for an entire spoon. This is only for the portion. And uh, after the presentation, um, I'd be happy to show, uh, a few years ago, I was working on one of these design litigations with an expert who's done a lot of these cases. And he, after, the, after the case, uh, he sent me a package, and he kindly he gifted me the actual spoons from Gorham B. White from 1870. So I have these here in my hand, so and they're keep other, other set of my office across the way. But, uh, and when you look at the actual spoons, because for a long time, all we had was an image, was a line drawing of White's spoon that was included in the Supreme Court's opinion. But having the spoons here, you could even see that the differences were between Gorham's spoon and White's spoon were even further, further apart. Now, it is critical that when you're looking at designs, whether you're, you know, you're going to be a, an associate coming out working at a law firm and you're going to be looking at a file for a cease and desist letter or you might be planning to assert an, a, a, an allegation of infringement, don't just look at these two things. Don't, don't, don't take the bait. Don't just look at these two things in a vacuum. You need to inform yourself and look at the context of the prior art in order to provide a backdrop. So in other words, if someone asks, you know, do, do, do I and Professor Lee look like each other? Are we substantially similar? Well, the question is compared to what? Okay, compared to a pack of elephants, we look very, very similar to each other. Compared to, let's say, he has a twin brother, then we don't look like each other much at all. So it's very, very critical that in the design context that you look at what the prior art is. This prior art was not reported in the case. This is for my own independent sort of research of what you might see at the time in 1860s, at the time that this was patented, what you might see out there, but also to prove a point or to show, illustrate a point. Now, you can imagine that if the prior art was much closer, okay, now when the prior art's much closer, the differences between these two things become more accentuated, become more amplified. So it's, in, in, and, and thus the, the, this is much more likely of non-infringement, thus the scope of the patent right is going to be shrunk once it's pitted against that particular prior art. But when we have a broad breadth with respect to the prior art, those differences are sort of lost in the noise, and therefore it's more likely that you're going to have infringement. Our test for in design patent infringement asks whether or not the two designs are substantially the same. So what's effectively happening there is that, if, to put it in sort of utility patent language, the doctrine of equivalence is rolled in to the infringement analysis for design patent infringement. You don't have literal design patent infringement and doctrine of equivalence design patent infringement. It's whether or not the two are substantially the same. So it's sort of rolled into the, the test itself. As far as sort of a restatement, um, this is uh, out of the Egyptian goddess, the 2008 en banc decision by the Federal Circuit. And in short, is the overall appearance of the patented design substantially the same as the overall appearance of the accused design in view of the prior art? That's sort of a nice, succinct um, articulation of the test itself. But notice how we're looking at you know, overall appearances. We're not looking at particular elements. We're looking at the overall appearances, and you know maybe even you could further refine that by saying the overall appearance of the claimed design. You know, so we're only looking at, you're not going to look at the entire coffee cup if only the handle is, handle is claimed. So what do we do with claim construction? We know that the Markman decision uh, by the Supreme Court in the mid-1990s charged the courts with uh, construing patent claims. And so what you have is a period of time from that 1995 until the Egyptian goddess case in 2008 where you have district courts and the Federal Circuit using this utility patent case law, which says for a patent case, the court must construe the patent. But that case was a utility patent case, the Markman case. 
And you have the court now, the courts, you looking at design patents. Say, well, the court didn't specify. They said a patent. So I guess we're going to do the same thing we do for utility patents. We're going to do that for design patents. So you end up having courts looking at designs and articulating them in a very similar way that they might come up with a claim construction for utility patents. Which is sort of odd because we just went over what Gorham v. White, what the Supreme Court said is this is an ocular, a visual inspection of the two particular designs, both the patented design and the, and the accused product. Where is there any room here for verbalizations? Because we know a design patent claim, you've got the title of the claim, the, the specification is just a figure description typically. And then you have the images, and they're typically the six orthogonal views and perhaps a uh, perspective view or so. But that is what defines, uh, defines the property line, not some type of long written specification that you might find in a utility patent. It's the drawings, as they say, the drawings are worth a thousand words. So, for instance, in a case like this where you've got the patented design on the left, the accused design on the right, what courts were doing um, is saying, well, we've got to construe this patented design. That's what the Markman courts, the Supreme Court told us to do. So uh, let's get in there and try to construe this. And I can recall even when I was clerking for Judge Pallmeyer, having gone through uh, one of these, and as a dutiful law clerk, sitting down there with a particular design, putting pen to paper, and trying to describe one of these things as best as you can using words which are often ill-equipped without use of mathematical formulas, differential equations, to actually define what something is. So here, here's, here's the take in this particular case. All for a ceiling fan. Um, 500 plus words is the court trying to explain the ceiling fan. Uh, using phrases like fin-shaped, sweeps, partial sphere, running pointed star, generally football shaped, uh, sharply angled rounded corner, uh, a valiant effort, a valiant effort. Um, but at the end of the day, what are we doing here? Is this helping anything? And what it ended up occurring is that for defendants, it was quite a great tool because you were just basically, people were using a sort of an all elements type of mindset where you say, are each one of these elements there, go through the checklist. And now you've created, no one in their right mind would ever draft a utility patent claim 500 words long like this. I mean, if you did, it was a pretty, pretty poor effort, I would say, um, that you would define something so, so narrowly. So this idea of verbalizing claims is something that uh, those of us in the bar who are sort of um, uh, keen on this area of the law were filing amicus briefs. And as much as we talk about Egyptian goddess in 2008, the interesting part, uh, one of the parts that I was sort of most proud of was the amicus briefs that we filed thoughtfully in vain at the time uh, in multiple cases, raising issues. Um, and one of them was this claim, this verbalization uh, issue in cases that predated Egyptian goddess. And when Egyptian goddess comes around and Judge Moore, who had wrote the opinion that the, the petition for and bonk was filed upon. Um, the court, when they get together, they come up with a, a whole laundry list of other issues that they want briefed that were not the issues that were before the court. Were, these were all issues that they were cataloging from the previous five years of all these other amicus briefs that we were filing. So it was, it was quite um, rewarding that the court was listening all these years because the, the reality is they don't give a lot of attention to, to design cases as it is. So instead of doing long verbalization. Some other courts were just saying, it's the design figures as shown and described. That's what defines the claims. We, we, need not, we need not get in there. And ultimately, the Federal Circuit in Egyptian Goddess says that. And it sort of put to rest this long, dark area of at least 15 years where the courts were going through and doing these verbalizations of, of design claims. And says, as a general rule, they should not be attempted. So right now, it's, uh, and you see this played out in the cases, it's courts will just say, we're not going to go through that, it's unnecessary, rather we're just going to rely upon the drawings. Okay, So this is important because you, know, you might be litigating cases in particular jurisdictions where there's local rules that require these type of claim constructions as part of those. There needs to be some education to, for, for also amongst the, the council, but also to the court, that in a lot of these situations, those local rules for patents don't necessarily apply to design patents. Um, and it's important that you go through that because 
you know, should you be embarking upon a full-blown claim construction with expert witnesses and everything else when effectively the court says this is unnecessary? So on, on functionality, um, when, it, when you're looking at design rights, um, I look at design rights when I'm looking at something like this. So I look at everything as faux. I don't remember that, F-A-U-X. Whether or not this, think about like, a, you know, staging furniture that they provide. Whether or not this actually functions as a swivelable stool, that's not the issue. Does it take this particular appearance? That's all that matters. So it's not whether or not this, you know, what I see in a lot of cases where there's an accused product and the defendant's like, well, ours swivels differently. Ours has different types of hinges and they swivel smoother than yours do. That doesn't matter at all for design patent cases. It's only about a snapshot in time, that particular image, and those images that were provided in the claims. So it's not the swivelability, it's only the appearance. Similarly so, another bedrock concept that uh, would, I would think, put to rest so much of the discord in the design patent jurisprudence is a strict adherence to the principle that design patents do not protect general ideas or concepts. So, for instance, somebody comes forth and they've got a computer mouse in the shape of a turtle and they get a design right on it. Somebody then comes along with an accused design uh, that is the same concept, a computer mouse in the shape of a turtle. This design right is not going to be infringed by this accused design. I don't care what the prior art looks like. That is not going to be they, they, they're the same idea but the actual expression of those things looks so very different that, you're not, that, that they're not going to be considered to be substantially the same. But this is, the, this is sort of a, if, if, you, if you were to assign this type of conceptual level protection by saying this is going to protect any computer mouses, then you're getting into that type of protection that you see in, in a utility patent context where you're protecting the idea <laughs> irregardless, regardless of the actual execution of that. This is, this is not that unique of a concept. Just go over to copyright law and think about the idea-expression dichotomy. That's exactly the same concept here, but it is very, uh, it, it, it would put to rest a lot of the confusion to, these, to the worry of sort of runaway design patent claims that they're protecting too much. Well, if you just adhere to this and you protect the, concept, the expression of it um, and those things that are substantially similar, you put that to rest. So the two issues that we talked about at the outset, one is statutory compliance. Is the, el is the design eligible for design protection? And the second issue, which the proposition in the book, at least with respect to the US chapter, is that this should not even be undertaken. Um, but are there any aspects of the appearance to be disregarded? Now notice that I say any aspects of the appearance. Perfectly. It, it makes perfect sense that you, re, you do disregard any of the underlying functional, the abstract qualities, pur purposes, of, or, or characteristics. In other words, if you've got a product uh, on scissors and how well the scissor blades cut or what is the tensile strength of the blade, those are features that should not be regarded in a design context. Those have no application whatsoever. But the appearance of the blade the appearance of the hinge, those things do, uh, uh, do, do matter. So, but here, but any aspects of the appearance of the elimination of a feature, that should not be undertaken. So the first issue, eligibility. Second issue is more on claim construction. Let's give some examples here. There is um, great discord on the approaches, and that was one of the things that really bears out in the book, is once you go worldwide, there's all sorts of different approaches to determine an, whether or not something's eligible for protection. Um, one looks to whether or not there's alternative designs. Another test looks to say, did the creator of the design, did they have any design thoughts in their mind when they were creating um, this particular cutting blade? Was that, is, is there any aesthetic consideration that was provided? And then there's even a third test, which for instance in South Africa, and even sometimes has bubbled up here in the US, is looking through the mind of the consumer. Does the consumer care what is the appearance of a drill bit? Do they, do they care at all about what the aesthetics look? And 
you know, whether that question, whether they do or don't, I guess the, the question is whether that should be the test um, for, for this approach. The U.S. adopts the first approach, and what we've just seen recently, a couple months ago, it's fair to say that Europe has now um, adopted a combination of two and one. Um, so in, in the statute, I think it's helpful to, to look at design patents and utility patents side by side, the sort of the uh, statute for subject matter. Design patents are codified in section 171, where utility patents, which we hear so much on the news about section 101, um, you can see I've highlighted the word sort of where the rubber hits the road. Whoever invents any new, original, and ornamental design, here's our design, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process machine manufacturer composition. So those two particular words, notice that they're stated in a positive sense, in that they're not saying a design has to be non-functional. It doesn't say that. The statute doesn't say that. The statute just says that it, the design, in order to be eligible subject matter, must uh, have uh, must be ornamental. Now, in the 101 section, 101 section, I mean, we know the whole history there about how broadly that term is. We're, we're using this in a very inclusive sense uh, and, and liberally interpreting these statutory provisions, these gatekeeper requirements, minimal gatekeeper requirements. But juxtaposing the two, it's, it's, it's critical to note that they are, um, they are not mutually exclusive of each other. Um, this doesn't say any useful non-ornamental process machine manufacturer. And on that note, note that when you're reviewing utility patent cases, you don't see efforts to go into the utility patent claim and try to eliminate any functional, any uh, ornamental aspects. If, if a designer uh, in a, on a utility patent used the claim element that something needs to be frustoconical, we don't jump at that and say, oh, we gotta, we gotta pull that out of the claim. That's that's an appearance element, so we gotta, we gotta knock that out. But we do see it on the design patent side. We see this continual knee-jerk reaction to wanna eliminate features out of the design. The Supreme Court um, spoke once, it's sort of in dicta, but has said, well, how are we going to determine whether or not something is ornamental? And what the court said is that, are there alternative designs? We want to look to see if there's alternative designs. In other words, if the design, if the, if the particular appearance, the, the, the ball bearing, if there, that design is dictated by function, okay, that the function is what tells us what that form means. There's no sort of independent design input that's going into there. It's the function which says this has to be perfectly spherical. And so it's the same thing here, is that the, the appearance is not dictated by function. If, you, if there are alternative designs, this means that the function isn't dictating, that there are choices that you can make um, along the way. And this, the Federal Circuit has recently really adopted this as the telltale sign, is that are there alternative designs for this? So a couple examples for this statutory compliance. Uh, example one, if you look at the, this particular monkey key, a key with a monkey head on it, it's sort of a whimsical type of ID, but it will get the point across is that are there alternative designs that can achieve this? Or if we provide a design right for this, are we monopolizing keys as we know it? Okay, there are, is there a concern? Is this like the ball bearing where if we gave this design right on this particular shape, no one could ever make uh, the, the, the spherical shape that executes the function of a, of, a, of a ball bearing? If we provided this, can nobody ever use a key? No, of course not. There's myriad ways that you could come up with uh, a shape it doesn't have to be a monkey because many different monkey heads that you could do it you're not going even by providing this particular right you're not providing a monopoly right a limited monopoly right for this uh, for monkey keys no it's it could be any monkey key or it could be an animals or it could be any, whatever shape that you want on that and it still could function as a design so here's some examples alternative designs so this you right off the bat we know there that that this that this is in, in is safe now, what if we just claim the upper portion of the key? <coughs> well, we're only, are there alternative forms for key handles? This one's probably even easier. Um, certainly, there's, there's tons of them, and I'm just giving you monkey ones. There could be all sorts of animals that you could use. So there's no fear of any type of monopolization of the 
of the function of a key handle if we provide this particular design right. Now where things get a little hairy is now if, if the applicant had only claimed the keyblade. Okay? So you only claim the particular keyblade there. Now, if we give a design right in the keyblade, does that co-op, does that effectively cover um, the functional quality of this keyblade? Well, uh, at least one court here in the United States has said yes, it does, and said that if we provide a design right on this, there are no alternative designs for that particular keyblade because it has to matingly engage uh, a, a corresponding keyhole in order for that to work. Now, there are certainly, as we know, there was tons of different keyblades. Um, we, we know that just because each one of us in our pocket has, has different keyblades with different designs. But going to what particular keyhole? So this really shows that the, one, of the, one of the battlegrounds in these cases is what is the function that you're going to ask whether or not, is it just any key that fits a keyhole? Well, then there's many different options. But is it a, is a key that fits a particular keyhole? Well, then maybe there might only be one unique solution to that. So this was in a case called Besslock, um, was this case here. It's the only federal circuit, published federal circuit case, where they've uh, invalidated a design patent on grounds of functionality. Now, some people look at that and frown upon that. Um, but I think it makes perfect sense because there are just so few... Uh, ideas that can only be achieved with one single way. I mean, the ball bearing. When I surveyed for this book, and I remember leading up to it, I, I serve as the chair for the AIPPI Designs Committee, I had asked on the committee, and we've got about 30 people globally in all different countries, look at your case law and find me any cases where the design was eliminated on functionality grounds. And there was only a handful of cases worldwide. It's, it's, and, and, and that's because, it's not because there just hasn't been that many cases, it's because it's just rarely are you going to find something where you have the, the, the claim portion can only be designed in one particular way. And in this case here was even a 2-1 decision. Judge Newman, Pauline Newman at the Federal Circuit, wrote a very lengthy opinion saying, well, who is to say that, you know, what if the designer designed the key and the keyhole? So, you know, you don't really design a key and to go into another hole. Most key designers are designing both things. So those are both products of their own creation. So why should we, why should we limit to that, that those are the two things that they've designed? Or further, who's to say that this is even, that this is even to be a key to ever mate in another keyhole? Perhaps it's a piece of jewelry. Perhaps it's a child's toy. Perhaps it's just a form that... So to, to state that it has to fit into another key blade, you're going outside the four corners of the document itself, and, and pulling in limitations that are not in the, not in the patent uh, document itself. So, but as it stands now, uh, this case was held to be non-compliant. But it's the only one that we have. And courts have sort of gone through this. You can see situations here with, uh, in this case, you know, the court here said that this is dictated solely by function. I think this is a bad, bad decision. Um, you know, just watch a watch an NFL football game or a baseball game, you watch the face masks. I mean, there's a whole lineage of different designs for face masks. But to say that this is the only face mask that can achieve to stop the softball from going into your face, um, I think it, it doesn't really jive with what designers do. Or furthermore, saying that this is the only head strap or the only types of uh, the, the, the chin to chin strap, many different ways to design this. This is not, you know, the... Uh, finding the sort of Rosetta Stone of the only way to execute this particular thing. Bad decision, but it goes to show where, and, and although I've mentioned that this is so rarely found in cases, you see it in, I'd say, well over 50% of the cases, you see these arguments about that the design's functional and therefore it's invalid. You see it all the time. Um, you see it, uh, and, and I think one of the reasons why is because very often in these cases, it's, it's uh, attorneys and counsel coming from a utility patent background, arguing a patent case, and th they're very well versed in util ut you know, utilitarian arguments, and they bring that into this and think, well, design rights are, they can't be, the, 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 the game is utility patents. 
we can't be talking about functionality over here. So we, we, we this shouldn't even be permitted. Well, it is it is permitted, but in a situation like this, I think a faithful application to show that there are alternative designs would have led to a very different result. Uh, automobiles. Um, that you see this quite often. Arguments saying, well, this is functional. Um, that. The, the, the design is functional to achieve this particular aerodynamics. Well, the, again, if you're asking whether or not this is functional, you're asking the wrong question. And that's to whether you're at the attorneys or to judges. If that's the question you're asking, it's the wrong question. The statute says, is it ornamental? Okay, the statute is asking, is it ornamental? Just like the statute um, says for utility pads, is it useful? It doesn't say, is it non-ornamental? It's asking, is there, is there that minimum amount uh, to do it? So it can have uh, function, loads of function it can have it, but the, the requirement, does it, can it have, uh, does it have ornamentality? In contradistinction to trademark law, specifically trade dress law, the Lanham Act, where there you're dealing with rights that can go on in perpetuity, okay, think about like that, like the Coke bottle or something like that. There the statute says that the design has to be non-functional, okay? Very different. One says non-functional for trade dress, the other says ornamental. Those are not, those are not Janus face, those are not the, the, the opposite of the other one. Um, this one just says, is there, this one could be ornamental plus a lot of functionality, but it just needs to be ornamental. This one says you can't have any functionality, it's got to be uh, devoid of, 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 of um, functionality. So two different ways to state that. So the car itself, I think you could show that there are alternative designs to this. Walk down Madison Avenue and you'll see that. Tire treads. Now I'm starting to get you some of the more fun cases here where, you know, tire treads. This is one of those cases where it depends on the battleground. Are there alternative designs for this particular tire tread? Well, the defendant in these cases is going to say, no, there's only one particular design, and that's the one that you have there, and we cannot provide you that monopoly right. It does not meet the statute. It's not ornamental. It's dictated by function alone. So they might try to define the design right in a mathematical sense, setting forth, well, in order to achieve this particular tire tread, it has this particular traction, this particular aer aerodynamic qualities. Every particular angle is there. On the other side, what if, what if, you know, are there any alternative designs for things to provide positive traction? What if that was you just put a much more abstract, broader type of sense? Well, then there's a lot of different tires that can be used to do that. Following these tire cases, and there's been a lot of them, and generally speaking, the USPTO has granted protection on tire treads, and they've been litigated a lot, um, that what's found through those cases is that when we go to a tire store and we go shopping for tires, the majority of what you see on a tire is not there as anything to do with traction. It's all about point of sale, and it's all about trying to get the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the buyer's attention in buying those particular things. So, there's a, so it turns out there is a heck of a lot of ornamental design that goes into uh, tire treads for the point of sale purchase. Uh, another example here is on this particular screw. You can see a lot of it is functionally driven design dictated by function, but then there's a portion of it. So this is one of those things where, where and this is probably, you know, not to, uh, presumably to fit um, some other tool that would allow you to, but also in situations where maybe you have a nice vanity for your powder room and you don't want to have a big Phillips screw or regular screw head that you're looking at, you might want to have something that's more ornamental to look at, and so on a portion of it you might have that element. So the question here is, is the overall appearance dictated solely by function alone? And I think you can show that there is portions of it that are not, so this probably just squeaks by as far as, as, far as protection. So let's get to the issue two here. We got just a, a few minutes left, and I just want to hit on this last issue, and this is the issue of claim construction. This is where there are any aspects of the design that uh, should be disregarded. And you have a whole series of cases where the court says, well, here's the design right on the left, here's the accused product, and the designer notices that these are not in the accused product. So the designer, the actual patent applicant, says, your honors, you should eliminate these particular features because they are dictated by function and they shouldn't be included. 
And Judge Lurie, in this particular opinion, says, no, 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 you included those. Those are limitations of your claim. We're not going to do this post hoc, ad hoc elimination of features. You included in them, and therefore they are going to be used in the comparison as points of difference between your design and theirs. There's no none of this after the fact stuff. So th there, the court said, even if they're functional, they stay part of the claim. Well, a couple years later, Judge Lurie switched and came up and said, well, in this particular situation, these tail and fins, they are not part of the claim design um, because they're dictated by function alone. So uh, I want to just get to this slide here because I want to get to the last cases so I can get to. I don't want to leave you with the false impression that this is where the case left off. So I'll get to the last two cases we'll speak about here just really quickly. So fast forward over this dark period where the, where the courts have been eliminating features, okay, and going through. We don't do this with old features. We know that, right? If you have a combination of five old shapes, put them together in a novel way, we don't say that's old, that's old, that's old. We, we don't do that because we know that the right is the combination, right, the amalgam, the ensemble. But here, the, this is a court with this particular uh, surgical tool, the torque knob, the activation knob, the trigger. The district court went in there and just hacked out these features. And this is not that unique in the sense of the U.S. You'll see this. You go all throughout the world, you're going to see this approach being used. But the court said, to, came to its senses and said, we're not going to do it this way. You don't eliminate features altogether. You might diminuate their importance in the overall appearance, but you don't eliminate these particular features. But the district court's construction of design paths have no scope whatsoever fails to account for the particular ornamentation of the claim design and parts from our framework for interpreting design patent claims. And then the second case is, these old habits die hard. Here, the district court said the armband and the side torso for this sort of flotation device, those are dictated by function alone. They must be eliminated. And the court came back and said, no, you don't do that. So I will leave it at that. I. The, 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 the important parts, I think, the two to take away is, one, one you've got the functionality doctrine. Do you meet the statute? Um, I think that's very liberally, it's a gatekeeper requirement. So don't be so uh, concerned about that in getting protection. And the second issue is this elimination of features. Um, if you take a step back, there's really no need to be eliminating any of the features because the right itself is on the overall appearance, the combination of all the features. So I could take uh, questions after the fact, but I think we're near the, uh, the end of the hour.